Welcome. It's great to see you guys. So to start it off, can I ask you, Ivan, to briefly introduce yourself and our speaker? Good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm Ivan Krilov, and I'm glad to be here. Uh, so yes, I've been working on Java virtual machines for the past 15 years. Uh, some of you may remember my talks at previous JugRU events, like Joker, Joker, uh, uh, AJ, AJ Point. Um, but today is, uh, is not going to be my talk. Uh, but we have a very special guest that I'm, I'm really delighted to introduce to Jean Philippe. Although Jean Philippe had least very little introduction because he has been to all conferences before. Um, he's a job champion, so uh, there's only very few job champions out there in the world. So really delighted to have a job champion presenting to us today. Uh, Jean Philippe is a very special person because he has a deep depth knowledge not only about uh, Java um, internals, but also about CLR. So we'll talk a bit about that in a minute. Uh, John Shafil has experience for more than eight years on low latency trading systems. We're working on those. And uh, also before joining Datadog, where he works right now, he works at Criteo and had, had a job there optimizing thousands of machines um, uh, in produ for production use. Um, um, so a really good, solid experience in those jadeding clusters and uh, you know big data centers, so that's that's why I'm here. That's what I want to learn today: how to deal with those massive deployments. Um, so, Jafilip, uh, good morning, first of all, and welcome. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Ivan. Yeah. So, uh, can I say a few words? I know that you are very curious about what's happening in the not only in JVM world but also in, in the CLR world. Yes. Um, do you see, yeah, um, do you think uh, that CLR as a virtual machine, as a virtual, you know, as a runtime environment, evolves as fast as JVM or slower or maybe even faster? Yeah, it's, um, the, the design is the same. They, they are basically doing the, the same abstraction that the, the JVM, but the, the, the design is some, somewhat different. Um, and, um, Right now, with the, the open sourcing of the, the, uh, the .NET Core, they have um, a lot of uh, traction from the community, and uh, they're moving fast, uh, moving faster than, than before uh, on this technology, improving the JIT also, um, and uh, the GC a little bit. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's a moving community, um, and uh, that's very interesting also to to, to look at uh, those uh, because uh, there is very interesting things that maybe sometimes the JVM is not doing and then, um, on the opposite also JVM is doing something that not the CLR is doing. So that, that's very interesting to, to see the both point. Uh, do you think that in terms of like monitoring and performance analysis tool support, do you think they are on par or is JVM in a better position? Um, uh, how is it? From monitoring perspective, from my opinion, um, the, the 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 tooling from .NET is some somewhat a uh, little bit raw. Uh, you have to deal with a lot of native part uh, pointer address and and everything. Like on JVM, there is a, a good abstraction on this, and uh, you can deal with uh, directly object. You 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 don't deal with the the address of the, the object. Uh, uh, Day to day, while if you if you're debugging troubleshooting very very nasty issue on .NET uh, on CLI, you you have to deal with this addressing and uh, where the objects are located and how to 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 go through them uh, into a heap dump, for example. Well, on JVM you you don't need that and you just follow the, the reference uh, basically and that's it. So it's a uh, yeah the, the approach. It's a little bit different, but uh, the the result is the same anyway. Sounds a little bit like Wild West, uh, <laughs> Wild West times. <laughs> yeah, yeah they, they, they are good tooling anyway, and, uh, but, but sometimes it's it, it's it's uh, like um, kind of funny because you know, you're on Windows usually, and there is a lot of UI and uh, something like that. And but for debugging, it's sometimes very like uh, CLI command line and, and with commands, like very cryptic command. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it's kind of funny. 
fun. It's kind of vice versa with how we have it in Java because it's mostly used for backend. But then if you want to do some nice uh, profiling or anything like that, you usually have really nice uh, UI tools like JFR, which I suppose you are going to tell us all about yeah. uh, right about now. Shall we start? Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah the floor course. is yours. Good luck. Thanks. So yeah, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Jean-Philippe um, and uh, I'm working at Datalog. And I think everybody one day has used a profiler for, for fine performance issues. And, um, and JFR, while uh, not just a profiler, is designed for production time. And uh, we are using it uh, massively at Datalog. And in, in this talk, yes. Oh, sorry, thank you. Um, and um, so, um, and uh, in this talk, I'm going to talk to you uh, about uh, real-world experiences using JFR at Datalog at a large scale and uh, the pitfalls we encounter and how we fix them. So the ag agenda is very simple. Uh, we'll start uh, with a quick introduction to the JDK flight recorder, move on to how we use JFR at Datalog, and finally uh, see what um, lesson we learned uh, from using uh, at scale. So um, the JDK flight recorder is like the data flight recorder you, you would find uh, on a commercial jet. Uh, but instead of recording what's happening in an aircraft, it will record what is going on in the JVM uh, and the, the application running uh, in the, on the JVM. The flight recorder, even when recording quite a lot of different kinds of imp information, has very low overhead. Um, it's typically less than a percent unless you hit uh, an edge case or enable some really expensive events. But uh, more about that soon. Um, those, there are a lot of useful uh, APIs and tooling around to do uh, things like controlling the flight recorder or record your own custom events. And, um, and the kind of events that are available by default in, uh, in OpenJDK uh, can be used to solve a wide range of problems uh, from really general ones to the very specific. Um, <clears throat> JFR technology is only available on, on uh, Hotspot JVM. It is used uh, in commercial Oracle JDK2, uh, but has been open sourced uh, in, uh, with uh, OpenJDK11. Recently, it was uh, also backported to JDK8 uh, because uh, obviously a lot of people are still uh, using it, right? Um, so JFR is available uh, since uh, 8 update 262 uh, for most uh, vendors like uh, Azul, Adopt, uh, OpenJDK, uh, Adoptium now, uh, Bellsoft, uh, Red Hat. Um, but um, the, uh, um, the version 8 update 272 for upstream build is used into um, uh, official OpenJDK Docker image. So internally, um, JFR has a, um, a thread local buffers to emit events into, um, and they are recorded. So to avoid contention uh, while, uh, while the thread of your application is emitting this, uh, this event, for example. Um, and once the, the thread local uh, buffers are full, they get copied into a, a secure uh, arrangement of global buffers. And depending on the configuration, um, these buffers can simply keep overwriting them uh, and decide to dump them at uh, some other time or emitting them to, to this for further analysis uh, on your local machine uh, or your uh, observability uh, system. Uh, the recording en engine uh, itself is uh, pretty performant. Uh, it's using a lot of tricks uh, to ensure that producing events are very cheap and that uh, the in-memory cost of emitting them uh, stays low. It's using invariant TSC, so hardware timestamp counters, to get the time. Um, it records the data into thread local uh, native buffers, so no synchronization, as, you, uh, as I mentioned before. It uses um, plenty of tricks to keep them uh, nimble, like uh, LEB128 uh, algorithm encoding for uh, integer comp compression, constant pools, and so on. The data itself, um, the events, are also collected uh, cheaply, uh, for example, by using uh, data that is already being collected by the, by the runtime. Um, also, uh, by being built into the runtime, the event can skip abstraction that are meant to isolate an, an API from the actual implementation of the, in a JVM. 
Uh, finally, uh, JFR is also trying hard uh, not to change the runtime characteristic to the application. For example, um, naively implementing uh, allocation, allocation profiling would, like, would likely undo uh, scalarization optimization, um, as known as escape analysis, uh, making your uh, GC behavior look very differently if the profiler is running. Uh, with the, the JFR allocation profiler, it is not a, a problem. Uh, there are other problems, uh, but uh, more on that later. Some um, other interesting properties of JFR is that the, the file format is self-describing. Um, in the, the recording, there will be a special event which contains metadata describing the, the layout of the events um, and the types involved. So the, the, the parser can readily use it. Um, there is no need to update any parsing code just because some events have been added. Um, events can be added uh, dynamically even with custom structures. All the constants are required, uh, like names, uh, to resolve the events in the chunk are also contained in the chunk. Uh, so having a chunk, uh, you can pass it, and um, and the recording is simply one or more uh, chunk. Uh, sorry, one or more chunk um, uh, from another. Okay, let's do uh, a quick demo of uh, JFR now. Um, I will uh, switch to um, my uh, pet clinic application that I've installed, just a little bit uh, customized. Uh, yeah, probably um, the, um, uh, that would be an actual good time. So uh, just like as you're as you are wrapping up with the uh, demo, yeah. I want to run a quick poll. Uh, so for the Telegram channel that Gleb mentioned before, we'll have now a poll uh, where we're asking about uh, how big are your deployments? Um, so do you, when you deploy your application, do you need to look at just like a few servers, maybe a few dozen servers, and maybe a few hundred servers? Because we're talking about not just like a performance on a single node, but we're talking about monitoring performance on a lot of machines. So please t t uh, join the Telegram channel, uh, make a response on that. Uh, uh, in that poll, and we will recap the results and maybe discuss with uh, John Philip uh, in a, in ten or twenty minutes uh, what the audience is doing. Um, thank you, and uh, back to you, John Philip. Yes, thank you, Ivan. So uh, I will start the the, the, the Petlinic application um, by starting also a flight recorder. So I'm I'm starting a flight recorder uh, right away uh, with this uh, this uh, JVM option. Start flight recording. I'm putting the, the name of my file name uh, at the end, and when the, um, the 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 application is exiting, I will dump the my JFR. I also uh, will use um, uh, um, settings uh, with the, the profile uh, type. Uh, I will uh, mention that uh, later. Um, I can also use some uh, recorder options. Um, in this case, with the pet clinic application with the Spring framework, I have a, a, some, some deep um, stack traces. So I will increase the default stack depth that is uh, 64 to 1 to 8 to have full uh, stack traces without any issues. And I will mention uh, my uh, application here. I think it's right uh, to, to start with that. OK, it's starting. I have started the, the flight recording with the default naming. Internally, <clears throat> and then I will uh, start uh, a small benchmark to see how my uh, application is behaving. So I just have a script to curl uh, like um, 500 uh, uh, URL. So I will record the latencies inside it. And uh, yeah, and meanwhile, I could uh, check on my application. So get the PID with JCMD command. That's a very powerful command. And you have a lot of um, uh, command from there. So you can see that there is uh, not uh, not only a JFR, but also some uh, other uh, available command. Yeah, I'm just um, checking how the JFR is uh, is running my application. So we have one recording started with name one internally uh, and some max size of the recording. Um, I can uh, start an, a new recording uh, concurrently, like this, with jfr.start. Uh, so it, it hints me that uh, I, have, uh, I can use uh, this command to, to dump the, the, the jfr. So I will doing this 
I can, I can check that I have two recording now, MIM1 and MIM2. And then I can uh, now dump a, a recording with the name, that's the second one, and uh, a, name, a file name on disk, like I would say tmp2.jfr. So we, it dumped the recording two with 3.1 megabytes written on disk at uh, this location. And then I can stop uh, this recording now to let the, the, the first one uh, go in. So yeah, stop recording. I can check again if I have still my recording. Um, yeah, that's good. So now um, I have, um, normally I have my recording on disk here. I can check uh, this uh, with JFR command that is provided by the, on, uh, with the JDK. Um, yeah, so I think my in injection is done now. Okay, so I can um, I can stop my application and um, I can just check. Um, I have the, I can do that later. I will just, um, so I will check uh, the, the pet clinic JFR here with 35 megabytes of information. So uh, with the JFR command summary, on uh, this pet clinic JFR, and we can look at how it's going. So with this command, we have the, the version of the JK, number of chunks that we have inside this JFR, the duration of the recording, and uh, the histogram of the event by uh, type, and the number of events that are generated, and uh, the size of events inside the, the JFR. So we have a, a very large one with object allocation in UTLab. So there is a lot of allocation in, inside this application. And then let's see, for example, Java monitor weight. So we can print from the, the command line um, some events, particularly. Uh, so the, this type of events from the pet clinic. Um, and from this, you have all those events with the, the attributes that we have, the start time, duration, the monitor class uh, where we are monitoring the, we have the, the monitor, the, the lock, uh, and some other information and the stack traces. Uh, so by default on the, the, the print of the JFA, you have only five stack traces, but you can increase uh, uh, this uh, with the option stack uh, def uh, equals um, yeah, 64, it's, it's fine for, for that. And you have, um, uh, it's not equal space. Um, you have the full stack traces uh, with that. Um, and you can also print uh, this R output uh, into a JSON format. Uh, so you can process it with GQ, for example, to extract some data that you, you, you need just to, to, uh, uh, to troubleshoot the uh, 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 issue. So um, now that we have uh, finished my, my benchmark, let's see. Uh, let's process uh, some um, uh, some result to compare with um, for that. So I get this percentile and so on to uh, latencies and into the results. So I can compare uh, with let, that later. So if I'm the results, I have the percentiles of the rec the latencies of my application. And it looks like not very good. So let's let's uh, let's uh, look into a JDK uh, mission control to see uh, my recording and see uh, what uh, I could uh, improve um, on my application and what would be the, the the problem here for my latencies. So when when you open the, the JFR, you have um, the DMC that uh, analyzes uh, the JFR for you with a lot of uh, heuristics. And so we can sh show you um, where to look at and what is not very good. Uh, like for example, I'm very <laughs> short on my physical memory on my laptop, but that, that's not the issue here. Uh, we have a lot of thread allocating, so maybe we can uh, look into uh, a memory side of the GNC to see what's, what's going on. Um, so we have uh, here a page uh, about the histogram of um, allocated types. Uh, obviously, we have a lot of HRA, so string allocated uh, for a large amount. Um, so if we want to, we have also stack traces here, um, but if we want to, to see more on about the, the we will see in, into the, the JFR uh, recording that there is a lot of in, in, um, 
new TLAB events. So let's look at the, the TLAB allocation to see if we can find a thread that are allocating a lot and maybe uh, inside the code. Uh, that's uh, what's so we have here root thread. Um, so we have the stack traces here, uh, but we have also the a flame view of those. Very uh, normally, yes, okay. So we have a flame view here uh, from all the allocation. Uh, you can look at the, the code. And so if you understand your, your application, you can find that, okay, that's my vet controller application. So that's, uh, that's uh, something that I'm familiar with and it should be a uh, normal allocation. But um, yeah, that, that looks suspicious for me that uh, we have string builder here. Um, I'm not, uh, I'm not, uh, Remind, but it's it's not uh, not reconnecting that uh, we use String Builder directly here, so it's kind of strange. So maybe I need to, to look at this. Okay, so do this batch. Um, I, I will use the, the stack trace for that because there is a uh, the line number, so maybe it's more uh, precise to to look at those. So we have the the number of samples of allocation that we have inside my application, so I can drill down and to look. Uh, where it is uh, precisely, um, I think it's um, uh, this one or this one handle. Yeah, this one. And um, let's do down. Yeah, it's some uh, some deep stack traces. And okay, show that list. That's my method. And maybe it's here. No, that's a fine. Oh, it's, uh, that's the, the the regular one. But on this one, oh yeah, string builder. On line 124. Okay, let's look at the code on my VET controller, line 124. Okay, I have a debug, debug uh, log. Uh, I'm not in debug uh, normally, but oh yeah. Do, do you see the, the, the problem here? Um, I'm in debug, uh, I have a, a debug log line. I'm in info level normally, normally so I should not be the, see this, uh, this log line, but as uh, we have a concatenation here. Uh, before checking the log level, uh, we are concatenating uh, the, this uh, this call, and maybe it's it's allocating a lot. So maybe we can ch uh, change it to use uh, this. So it will call it, uh, not co uh, not uh, getting this object directly, not concatenating the string, and check the, the log level uh, inside. Or we can just uh, have the here. Yeah. Uh, checking for the for the log level. So with that, maybe we can improve the the, the application. We'll try to um, to recompile quickly uh, to see if the, there is an improvement um, on the on that uh, level. So I'll just use this for for uh, recompiling here quickly with the, this modification, and and we will see uh, with a bit quick benchmark if we we can do uh, better. Just uh, modify. Should be almost done for that. Yep. Okay. Good. So let's uh, yeah let's uh, let's restart the application now. Um, I will uh, so recall. Uh, oh yes, yes. Um, I will modify the. See if we are fixed uh, here with a new recording. So let's start our application again with the, the flash recorder enabled and then um, starting. Okay, and I will uh, relaunch uh, my, my small benchmark uh, with latencies, uh, but now uh, I hope it's fixed. Okay, um, and we can look in the meantime into um, other part of GMC. So we have, um, it's not only a provider, uh, we have a lot of, inform of information for that. So for example, you can look at uh, log instances, so you have all the mo those monitor class um, with the, the monitor address to say, Okay, it's um, it's unique or the other instances of this uh, this monitor class, and where what the threads are blocked and for how long. 
So it's very useful to, to see if there is a tension uh, in your application and where is it, because you have the stack traces again that are associated with those, uh, those things. Um, you have also file IO, uh, not, not a lot of record here, or it's very quick because we have threshold to not record all of them because you, you could be flowed by, by those. Um, there is a lot of exception, so that's something that we can also look at. So for example, no such method error. A lot of uh, for, uh, for, for that. Um, we have, of, of course, the garbage collection. So we have the, the, the post time for this uh, uh, parallel GC uh, with uh, some information that are very uh, internal of the GC where uh, some, some phases of the, the GC, if there is more, um, more time on, for example, compaction phase, uh, 12 milliseconds compared to the microseconds or one digit millisecond for the other part, that's also expected, but uh, you have more details on that, for example. Also the compilation uh, for JIT, uh, JIT, uh, JIT compilation or the VM operation for safe, uh, safe point operations, very, uh, very useful to have those uh, to troubleshoot uh, your issues. So let's go back, uh, I think, uh, yes, the, 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 the benchmark is done now. Um, I can uh, try to look at um, uh, the percentage of my new application and compare to, uh, to, the, to the previous result. So it's fixed and uh, yeah, latency is fixed. So the previous one, uh, we have those and when I fixed my issues, um, yes, yeah, so we have we have gained some some uh, some latencies into the percentile. It's less, uh, so we we could, we get the two milliseconds on the percentile, uh, not much here. And for the median, it's a little bit better also uh, with the, this uh, this fixed. So you can you can find uh, here um, with GNC and JFR uh, your your uh, and improving your application uh, that way. So let's go back to, uh, to our presentation now. We can move forward uh, about that. Um, and what we uh, next is the, when we are using JFR Datadog for building a continuous profiler. So capturing profiling data continuously, if it can be done at a reasonable rate, uh, offers some very interesting capabilities. Uh, for one, if something goes horribly bad, you always have detailed information directly leading up to the problem, as you, as you see with the demo. It also offers the ability to break down profiling data. For example, many events are associated with a, a time at a thread. And if you can provide context about that, uh, the thread is doing during a certain time, um, any profiling data captured during that time uh, can help uh, shed some more light on what uh, was going on. So, at Datalog, we have uh, our customer with multiple Java processes, so here just two, and we have installed uh, a JV uh, agent on all JVM that uh, we are profiling. Uh, this JV agent is using JFAR Java API to start the recording of JFAR. And uh, every 60 seconds, we are taking a snapshot uh, and upload it uh, into our Datalog uh, backend. Uh, to reduce the data to transfer and space into our backend storage, we are compressing it uh, with uh, LZ4, uh, which allow um, a quite good reduction in size for small CPU time and overhead consumed on, uh, on the customer side. Now, moving into uh, the inside the Datadog backend, uh, the uploaded uh, snapshots are uh, then uh, ready to be processed. Um, so each snapshot is passed as using uh, the GMC uh, core library uh, that is uh, provided with, uh, with GMC. Uh, we perform the analysis rules and collect the result as you, you see on, on the, the, the GMC page, uh, the startup uh, GMC page when you when you open the JFR recording, we have the, all those heuristics. So we are using it also uh, to, uh, to help the customer um, find the, the, the issue and uh, um, we prepare and pre-compute data for visualization as flame graphs into a storage for uh, events like uh, CPU, allocation, logs, exceptions, file and socket IOs. And fi finally, um, the, the customer can request them and, and, the, and then visualize them for, uh, from our web UI. 
So how uh, behave JFAR at scale with this kind of uh, architecture? Um, in fact, surprisingly well, um, we are in, in taking terabytes of JFAR data per minute um, from every Java processes of our customers. So usual recording size is five megabytes and two megabytes uh, when compressed uh, for one minute re recording. Um, inside those recordings, we have around like uh, one, 100,000 events and uh, one check uh, per minute. The CPU overhead uh, observed most of the time is uh, less than 2% of CPU time. Um, more on that later. And uh, considering all of this, the fact that we are continuously repeating metadata for every chunk um, costs us around like 0.5%, uh, which totally worth it as we can analyze independently, independently the, the chunks. So each chunk that we have uploaded, we can analyze it without other context uh, because of those metadata inside the, the chunk. <clears throat> JDK is bundled with two uh, templates of events, um, of uh, event settings, uh, the default and the, the profile. Um, at Datalog, we have specially crafted our uh, own event settings to balance the, the amount of information we can get and that are valuable for our customers. And the price in overhead, we are willing to pay. So we have activity allocation profiling um, exceptions, uh, um, reduce the, the rate of execution uh, sampling from 2.20 uh, uh, to 9 milliseconds, and adjust some event threshold like VM operation, uh, DC, bias locking, the optimization, etc., and uh, IOs, uh, monitors, and threads. So before um, releasing our profiler to the customer, we have performed some measurement of the overhead of our settings uh, that differs from the de default ones. Um, we have based our benchmark on the Spring Pet Clinic application that you, you see before. Uh, but the, the problem with it is that the, the request processing time is too short uh, to gather statistically uh, significance on the, on the latency of requests. So usually request latency is two, three milliseconds by default. Um, moreover, that's not the usual time and CPU time spent by most of the real world, uh, real workload uh, out there. So we decided to... Um, to customize a little bit uh, the application, we increased uh, the usual processing time per request to reach around 100 milliseconds per request, as you, you could uh, see in the demo. Uh, this to ensure that we have enough uh, CPU time consumed to measure something that is significant. To do so, we increase the number of entries into the in-memory uh, database uh, that is loaded at startup uh, to generate uh, enough load uh, and processing to reach the, the latency expected. So regarding the, the measurement done during the, the benchmark, um, we measured uh, EP usage and the work GC, uh, but also CPU through the, um, the PROC uh, file system. So from um, stat file, uh, you can obtain the num total number of CPU ticks uh, since the process started. So uh, it's, it's better than having an average CPU load over time. Um, it made the, the comparison easier by just comparing a unique number uh, at the end. So this measurement includes startup and warm-up type, warm -up time. Um, but if you run it long enough, you, you can modulate uh, this issue if, uh, if needed. However, measuring the startup can, in some cases, could be useful uh, because some customer could uh, report long startup that may affect their um, S check, for example. So if you are deploying on Kubernetes, for example, you need to have those uh, Health check uh, to to see that the cluster is is a uh, is a uh, is thinking your application is up and running or spawn another application. So you, you need sometimes to have the, the startup uh, in line with that. So beside the good result, we encounter some issues with some application. Um, so now we are moving um, to other uh, over the lesson learn uh, part of this presentation. Um, so the things uh, I will talk about, uh, about that during the, this part of the presentation are observation from using JFR at crazy scale uh, with very different kind of application. Uh, many will never encounter this problem, so, uh, or maybe even consider them to, the, to be a problem. Uh, Jean-Philippe, uh, yes. perhaps, now, perhaps now would be a good time actually to look at uh, what our viewers are doing. Um, 
Yep. So we sure. ran a poll that asked about you know how many deployments do people run. Um, so uh, roughly uh, the distribution is even, uh, roughly speaking. So we do have some viewers that are uh, you know watching or monitoring less than ten applications in their de in their you know de production deployment. Uh, but we do have a number of them, like a quarter of people uh, that are looking at more than or need to look at more than a thousand servers uh, when they deploy an application. So what you're about to go for with GFR scale is actually very relevant to a lot yeah. of uh, people that are right now watching live and probably watching sure. this recording later on. Um, so go on, Good. thanks. Good. So so you, you can learn from our experience and then for, for you. So, um, so the first one is the, the built-in exception profiling in JFR. Uh, so this, this one can be configured uh, to capture all exceptions or only errors. Um, it captures all quote and unquote ones. Um, so it seems very nice to, to enable errors, um, right? But um, according to uh, the Java language specification, errors are defined as error is the superclass of all the exception from which ordinary uh, programs are not ordinarily expected to recover. So we could expect that error in rare occasions. Well, not so fast. Uh, one of the most popular and widely used Java libraries, uh, Java CC, a parser generator, is used inside Lucene uh, for query parser, and Lucene is used inside Elasticsearch. Um, so this library generates a large amount of errors as part of the control flow in a parser. It throws a uh, look at success, a subclass of error for that, and so it floats uh, our recording and generates unattended overhead, both uh, CPU and recording size, which is not great. Um, time to build our own version of it. Uh, so we created a new JFR event as part of the JFR uh, Java API. Uh, you can customize your, your own uh, JFR event and uh, using instrumentation to insert um, this uh, event at exception creation. But um, to avoid having the same problem than before, we are sampling uh, the very first exception of each type, and then we are subsampling uh, to it a uh, target rate. So uh, for that, we, uh, we use uh, for, uh, PID controller theory. So PID stands for proportional integral der derivative. Um, so you can think of car cruise control to have an example of usage. Uh, so with that, uh, we can evenly uh, spread across time uh, those, uh, those events. Um, so if you don't know what PID controller is, like me before, um, PID controller is a control loop mechanism employing uh, feedback that is widely used in uh, industrial control system and a variety of uh, other applications requiring continuously modulated uh, control. Uh, a PID controller continuously calculates an error value as different uh, as uh, the difference um, uh, between a desired set, set point and uh, a measure process uh, variable, and uh, applies a correction based on proportional integral and derivative terms that denoted P, I, and D respectively. Hence the name. Most known uh, example of usage is temperature control, uh, thermostat, for example, or speed control into a car, the, the cruise control. So based on this PID control theory, we implemented an adaptive sampler, but based on only on proportional and integral uh, API controller. Um, when, uh, so when created the, the adaptive sampler, um, uh, it takes a window duration a target of samples, the, the famous set point per window. The initial probability is one, which means that we take all the sample and based on this uh, uh, prob probability, we are taking the sample or we are dropping it. Very simple. Uh, we are keeping the count of number of sample and number of tests against the probability performed. Um, and at the end of the, uh, of the window, a task is triggered to roll the window and perform some computation. So it reads the, the count and from an exponential uh, moving average, compared to the, the expected number of uh, sample and adjust the probability accordingly. Uh, so this task is the, the feedback loop. Uh, this way, we are ensuring that the number of events remain globally constant uh, over time and, and close to the, to the target we, we set. 
So allocation profiling is a very valuable feature, um, and it was introduced in TDK7 and based on TLAB management. Um, so most allocation happen inside the TLAB. Uh, so TLAB stands for Thread Local Allocation Buffer. Uh, it allows to allocate memory without contention uh, or concurrency management. So TLAB are allocated uh, by chunks of a couple of kilobytes. And once a TLAB is full, uh, we try to, to allocate a, a, a new one. Um, a new TLAB is created, uh, and the object uh, that we're trying to allocate is done in it. Uh, while all allocation inside the, the same TLAB are done into the, the fast pass, uh, it means that uh, we are not calling the runtime, and everything is done by the generated code by the JIT. So, and creating a, a new TLAB requires uh, to, to run trip into the, the JVM. Um, and this is at the that time that uh, we can collect the information of this allocation, the stack trace, the type, the size. Uh, also, every time a big allocation that does not fit into a TLAB, uh, we are emitting a special JFR event. Um, so normally, everything is fine with, that, uh, with this approach. Um, we have good performance. Uh, but considering uh, some beefy machine, um, uh, like 96 cores, for example, with some application where all running threads are rotating like crazy, uh, things can go very wrong. Um, then our event rate depends on some factors, like the number of threads that are allocating, uh, the size uh, and number of allocation made by each thread. Uh, for example, if you are allocating large object, uh, we will retry, um, we'll, we will retry um, more frequently T-Labs, um, and emitting more J5 events. Um, so let's take an example. Uh, we have an internal application using ACA framework and actor framework. Um, the allocation rate of this application is uh, around two to three uh, gigabytes uh, per second. And if we look um, at the, the space uh, state of our 25 megabyte JFR recording, we can see that we have like uh, 10 megabytes of um, for in new TLAB uh, event, the object allocation in new TLAB, with uh, for, uh, 400 thousand uh, events. So we we figure uh, figure out that um, allocation profiling had a, an issue regarding the, the stack traces, also internal storage into a hash map. Um, uh, it means that in some cases the, the hashing was de de degenerated, leading to a linear scanning into the, this uh, internal hash map. So fixing this hash code improved a, a bit the, the situation uh, of the, the CPU overhead, but still, the amount of data collected for allocation is very large. So we need another solution. And now it's uh, included in JDK 16. And I will, I will take a moment to, to explain. Um, so we take the ID from the, the JVMTI allocation sampler which in uh, OpenJDK since uh, 11. Uh, and it uses the same code path than J5 event, um, but you can specify the average amount of uh, memory between sample to modulate uh, the rate of event. But eventually, you want to, to be emitted a constant rate. Uh, so take again the inspiration from uh, PID controller to control the data production rate. Uh, this gives us the uh, controllable data budget, actual individual sample with context information like time and which thread, and the amount of allocated bytes uh, since the last sample for waiting as total allocation pressure inside the, the heuristic. Um, so this new allocation profiler has landed recently into JDK 16, as I mentioned, as the new allocation, uh, uh, new object allocation sample event. With this new event, uh, when we retry a TLAB, uh, the event emitted goes into uh, an adaptive sampler, uh, as described before, that will try to maintain a constant given rate of object allocation sample events in uh, whatever situation, dropping some if it needs to. It needs so. Uh, this throttling mechanism is generic enough to be reused for any other J5 events that may behave in a similar fashion. So J5 is providing um, also a way to, um, to perform a lead detection uh, with your old object sample event uh, without resorting heap dumps. Um, so that's a very valuable feature. Um, so 
This uh, event provides uh, for allocation sample, a stack trace, time of the allocation, uh, type, uh, and array size, if, it, if it's uh, an array. And optionally, reference chains uh, to GC words. So it's a it's very valuable feature, um, but uh, so we would like to, to, uh, to enable it uh, for our customer. But we face some issues when we try to enable it uh, for our customers. So let me explain how it works. Allocation sample, taken like allocation events in TLAB that we, we saw before, um, are kept into a bounded queue, like the 256 items by default uh, for keeping track of the object aging. Um, this is a priority queue sorted by object sizes, so biggest objects are retained because they are leading to higher leaks, potentially. Um, and objects are kept through um, a weak reference uh, to avoid any uh, other uh, additional uh, leak. <clears throat> Stack traces are stored into uh, the global uh, repository uh, shared with other uh, events uh, collecting uh, stack traces. All information associated like stack traces are also kept into constant pools. Uh, like symbols, method names, or class names. Uh, those constant pools are like dictionaries uh, that allow to store a compact version of the stack traces, kind of uh, a compression and to avoid re repetition of the, the, the stack traces. Uh, but uh, when uh, a sample is discarded from the queue because of a GC, um, stack traces are still into the repository and constant uh, remain uh, into the pools. As a result, uh, constant pools grow rapidly and are still flushed uh, into a snapshot on disk, which leads us uh, to unwanted overhead in terms of CPU and, and space. So to, to help us troubleshoot this kind of situation, we end up uh, building uh, the, in GDK Mission Control a constant pool explorer to visualize the content of those constant pools um, and space state uh, of each type. So it helps us to uh, to troubleshoot uh, this kind of issue. I can, I can show you an example that, that we had um, as a, a customer uh, to see um, how it looks uh, with the, this, new, um, this new page that we, uh, we, um, we add to, um, to the mission controllers. So we have added uh, a new page, constant pool, to look into the, the, the recording and uh, well, that's how it looks uh, from this. Um, so we have into this recording um, a large number of symbols. Um, so we have like 11 megabytes just for symbols. That's unusual. Uh, usually the, the, the most, cons the, the most uh, expensive constant pool is the stack traces. But here we have a lot of symbols, a very large number compared to stack traces that uh, come up with like a, more than half of the, the constant pools. Um, and you have the, the constant value inside it. Um, and if you uh, look at the number of count of those values inside the, the, this constant, constant pool, we have like 200, while normally you just have one unique instance of this. So there was something fishy in, in, in it. So that's, that's uh, how we can, we can troubleshoot those, those issues also. So going back to, to this, um, um, we, co we come up with a solution where JFR stack trace uh, repository dedicated to store uh, stack traces for the uh, old object samples event is added. Uh, at chunk rotation, every sample stack trace is looked up in this repository and is serialized. Other stack traces are simply removed. So we don't pollute the global repository with those. Um, finally, uh, JFR is providing execution sample events for CPU profiling, and uh, which are very cheap in terms of memory and overhead because uh, we actually sampling um, um, we are actually sampling sorry a fixed number of thread of each sample cycle, so constant overhead, um, and collecting those stack traces are not subject to save point. Uh, it's actually pretty similar to what is done in the internal API uh, async get calls uh, trace uh, that is used uh, by async profiler, for example. Uh, but we are not sampling all the threads, um, only Java ones, uh, not the JVM native threads or uh, from other libraries. Um, so we can, however, compensate the um, unaccounted CPU time by using other events, like uh, for locking, uh, for example. 
So we are thinking of improving the current CPU provider because we can leverage the fact that we are taking sample uh, when certain CPU time elapsed independently of the thread. Uh, and we can use Perf API, for example, and use hardware counters, uh, but not in containers, unfortunately. And But on the JFrost side, it has special events to deal with the, the thread halting um, that provides stack traces at the moment, at that moment. Uh, with exact workload timing. But to um, to avoid too much of those events happening, we limit the collect uh, to the outliers by using a threshold. Still, there are some edge cases, uh, like too much events just above the threshold, and you may pay an, uh, as overhead for the, the large amount of data collected. While on the other hand, uh, you may have a lot of events just below the threshold that affect the performance of your application, but you are not able to see them. So it will be nice if uh, JFR the workload provider, so we can uh, subsample and rate limit the event using, again, uh, the PID controller um, theory that we, we already use. We could also dynamically or workload profile by adding um, the commit method for event class uh, for another thread. So we are working on this currently to add it to OpenJDK, uh, so in, uh, in the future, maybe. So. Uh, wrapping up, um, JFR is more than a, a profiler so, and can uh, give us a lot of information about the, the behavior of the both uh, JVM and application. We have seen that despite mature uh, technology, uh, JFR has some corner cases that you need to be aware of, uh, some kind of application push some boundaries. So exception, allocation, or the leak profiler can increase the, the overhead depending on the situation. Uh, so at Datadog, we are trying to fix those issues and by contributing back to OpenJDK, so you can benefit from this into the, the future. Um, so recently, GMC8 is, uh, was released, um, and so if you are not familiar uh, with GMC, you can use the, um, the tutorial uh, that is uh, Marcus Hirt uh, was providing at this address. Um, you have also, uh, if you want to, to play with the GMC core library, you have uh, JShell with all the imports for GMC core to play with. Um, and I've put into the slides uh, some references. So you have the GitHub repo for GMC, you can contribute. You have a lot of, you know, of information from the, the blog of Marcus Hirtz, that's the, uh, the lead of uh, GMC. Uh, we have also published a blog about the way we, we see the continuous profiling at Datadog. Uh, and uh, I've linked the PR for uh, the, a blog about how we improve the JFR location profiling in JDK 16. Uh, and uh, if you're interested in the, the, the implementation of our adaptive sampler, there's the NPID controller. Uh, we have a Java implementation uh, that we have open sourced uh, into uh, our tracer provider and the JFR implementation in, uh, in the, into the JVM. And uh, if you're interested in the, how we, uh, we, imp we improve the, the JDK with the old object sample with the repository, I've linked to, to you the, the PR. And with that, uh, I've finished my presentation about Jeffa. I hope it's, uh, you enjoy it. If you have questions now. Uh, yes. amazing. We do have a uh, question. I'm sorry, Glab, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> I was just going to say thank you and amazing and so on, and that we should move on to the questions. I don't know, uh, you can take them. Uh, there is not so many in the chat. Yes, uh, there was okay. one question that was already, I think, answered, but. Uh, Maybe you can a little bit reiterate a bit more on this topic, which is what are the typical sizes of JFR recordings? Yes, um, if you if you use the the the, the, the default one, um, it's like uh, one two megabyte uh, per minute of recording. Um, it's not uh, or even less, uh, depending on the, the workload of your application. Um, at Datadog, we, we have uh, um, enabled more events uh, to, to gather more information uh, for the customer. So it's, it's a bit larger, uh, up to, to five, I think, uh, uh, depending, uh, again, on uh, the workload of the application. Um, and then we compress it to, uh, to send uh, to our backend. Yeah, uh, and what about uh, cases when you do allocation profiling? 
Uh, like that, it's it's the the, the variability uh, part of the recording, and um, it can go crazy sometimes depending on the application. Um, usually, we, we can uh, on those um, corner cases we we have like uh, 25, 30 megabytes of recording per minute. Uh, if you are using like an ACA framework uh, that's allocating a lot with a lot of threads. Yeah, it, it can go crazy. So to, to limit that, that uh, we have implemented this new allocation profiler. So we can say, okay, we have. Uh, I would like to have like uh, um, just thousand of events per second, and then you can limit the um, uh, the size of the recording and the impact that you have uh, continuously on your application uh, with that. Okay. Um, yeah, I have uh, some additional questions about that topic, but I do want to ask the other kind of topic. Uh, that Leo brought in in the in, in the chat room. Uh, yeah. His question is: What are your your top five suspicious things to look for in JFR? So, what are the things you you look for uh, first of all? I mean, usually, I mean, maybe you can give a little bit of history. Maybe a customer comes in and says, uh, "What do customers say? Do they say looks fine, but please check?" Or maybe they say. No, we. It seems like we regressed. Uh, like so, I, so. First of all, what is your customer? What does the customer tell you usually, uh, as they give, when they give you this JFR profile? And secondly, what other things do you look for? The top five things. You mean uh, for the application, or if they have issues with the, our continuous provider? Oh, okay. So, yeah, I think there are two cases. One case is when uh, you look specifically at the JFR recording, maybe stored in the server, and you investigate. Yeah. Another case is when you continuously monitor, which is which is like you don't know if the problem will happen or not. You just continuously monitor. So, I think the question about the top five things was more about the case when you do have like a full JFR profile. And and you know that there was some sort of a problem you look into. Yeah. But uh, there's there's a second part which is what you what do you look for in this automated mode in this automatic mode? Well, in fact, we, we are always um, um, at Datadog. We are always automatic. Uh, we we are always uh, recording this uh, anyway. Um, that's the, the goal of the continuous provider. Um, and then the the, the the customers are looked at uh, generally to. To the, the, the flame graph of the CPU to see how the, the application is behaving. Um, it's also very nice to see uh, uh, what part of the application is taking much of the time. Uh, they, they may not have any issues, but uh, having um, another look that just um, metrics, for example, um, how the we, we spend most of the time on which part of the application is very nice to as an observability system. So it just not up to just metrics or tracing uh, that you have dependencies between uh, uh, services, but how your 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 code exec is executed. In fact, uh, so it's CPU for profiling, it's allocation. Uh, if you have exception, because obviously exception is not something that you 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 are aware of uh, in a, from a production perspective. Uh, like for example, we we discovered that we have this uh, this number of exception or errors. In fact, that coming from the, the Elasticsearch, uh, Lucene and Java CC, uh, that's not obvious when you you run your application. It's kind of fine, and then when you look at the the numbers and when you look at those uh, exception profiling, you can see that oh my god, what what, what the fuck what is that? Because I, it, it's not the the but you expect that the normal application should not uh, uh, throw exception or errors, and then you have plenty of them. Like sometimes on on some customer application, we have like um, hundred thousand exception uh, per minute. Uh, it's large, <laughs> mm -hmm. and, and, and and usually customers are not aware of that, and, and it's uh, it's another way to to look at this. Uh. It must okay. be a common uh, problem uh, using exception for control flow. There are multiple libraries and frameworks who do that, and I guess it yeah. brings all sorts of trouble during the uh, during profiling. I know, Ivan, do you want, did you want to ask something? I've got a few. Of uh, yes, I, um, I can imagine that developers have this situation when they upgrade from one version to the next one. And they would like to have a comprehensive report on what has changed or regressed or not. Yeah. Um, 
is does Datadog uh, system provide you this sort of aggregation so that you get a comprehensive report of, like, have we screwed up things with, or maybe we improved, uh, or does it give you raw data that you need to compare yourself? Yes, yes, yes. We are we are aggregating. We have the this system per minute to to upload the the JFR because it, it gives us a good granularity. Uh, but then uh, looking at each each of, of of one one minute is not sometimes very um, handy. Uh, so we aggregate those. Uh, we have a, a sampling also to to look at, for example, 100 or 1,000 uh, um, um, profiles uh, files uh, over a minute. So we can have a, a larger uh, time window with this uh, profiling, and we have also um, uh, comparison that we can make uh, between uh, time window time range uh, profiles so if you have uh, deploy a new uh, new version you can compare those those profile uh, between before the, the the new version and after the, the new version okay nice um, another question came from our good friend andre pangin uh, so andre excited that you're watching Hello. us live and asking yeah, questions thanks. Uh, I hope you joined the Zoom call after this talk. But uh, yeah. Andre's question here is, have you considered async profiler for more comprehensive CPU or wall clock uh, profiling events? Yeah, we, we, um, we have not considered directly the, the async profiler, but um, well, we have think uh, we have thought of that at some point. But uh, yes, we 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 would like to improve, as I said in my presentation, we would like to improve the, the CPU profiling uh, part of the JFR um, to, to have something that is sometimes more similar to what uh, Async Profiler is, is, uh, is providing. Um, and ju just to the fun fact, it's that when we investigate uh, troubleshoot uh, to, uh, to the, the, um, the problems we, we had with uh, uh, the JFR and uh, some bugs into the JVN. Where we have used async profiler to profile the profiler, uh, actually. So, so still in theory, we are also using async profiler to to, to troubleshoot some some issues uh, because it, it gives us also some some insights. Uh, so, do you compare like what async profiler tells you and what your profiler tells you, and you compare if those no, no, that they no. Match? No, we, we could add, but it was not uh, the, the point here. It, it was most uh, of, uh, we have some issues of big overhead uh, inside the application, and uh, uh, we, we don't know. Because JFR is profiling the application, but not the JVM, uh, sometimes the internals of the JVM, sometimes we need an external profiler to give us information about that. Mm -hmm. Um, I know that some folks disable method profiling because they find it inaccurate in 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 at least in the older versions of JFAR. Um, when was it fixed? Um, I don't know because um, I was I'm not aware there is the big issues with that. Um, I mean, since since OpenJDK 11 um, and the open sourcing of that, it's it's uh, it's a uh, it's a very mature technology, and it was backported to OpenJDK. So it was confusing because uh, Oracle was uh, releasing this uh, JFR technology uh, since JDK 7 and 8, but for Oracle, the, the commercial uh, build basically. Um, but uh, so if you you, are, you can have an, an Oracle JDK 8 with an kind of old version of JFR, and you can have an open JDK distro uh, from Adopt Open JDK, uh, Zulu uh, from Azul or, or Bellsoft, uh, Liberica, and having the, the open JDK 8, but with the new version of JFR um, uh, with that. Um, so, and the, there's a lot of th things that are backported to, to 8, the fixes also um, from, from Azul or from, from us. Uh, data log. Um, so to, to keep this, uh, because obviously there is a lot of, of person that are still using OpenJDK 8, um, and uh, it's it's very useful to, to have that. But uh, I'm not aware of, of um, particular issues with the the. Um... Mm -hmm. Are we losing? Uh, for thing is just gathering. Uh, Jeffrey is also capturing stack traces for elegance. Yeah, we lost you for a short second, but I think it's all right now. Ah, okay. 
Sorry. So, uh, uh, you did the poll the audience uh, about uh, their skills, and there are a few people who are running over a thousand nodes that have to be monitored. But I suppose that the data doc you must be streaming in all of those flight recording from way many more JVMs. Can you share any sort of uh, ballpark guess for how much it is? Yes, basically with with the the, the continuous provider, um, we have like thousand customers. And for each customer, they, they have like, uh, sometimes it's just one or two instances, but some are very large, uh, uh, hundreds of instances. Though, so you, you can imagine that we have hundreds of thousands of uh, JVM processes that are uploading uh, continuously every minute, uh, the, the, the profile and 24 seven. Cool. And can you like give an estimate of how much uh, traffic it is on the network? Oh, honestly, no. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> All right. Then. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We need okay. to do the math, but <laughs> I don't know. I don't know uh, this uh, figures in mind. Cool. Uh, then uh, the follow up question is uh, based on this huge scale, uh, I suppose you must have discovered numerous issues in the JFR or maybe even JVM itself. Is that so? The more load you have. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Yes, we are, we are. so I have talked about them um, mostly in, in my talk, and uh, but we, we have some issues that we have reported uh, also um, um, to uh, to OpenJDK. I um, will propose a, a fix. Um, there is some still open open issue, um, but not really easy to fix. Um, we, we had issues with um, um, with full disk. It's kind of crazy, but we have with uh, with containers. Uh, you are limiting your your resources uh, in some way, and sometimes you you don't you don't see them directly. So, for example, if you start a container with like a one gigabyte of disk or, or less, sometimes it's it's less. Um, you you, do, you don't have a lot of disk. Uh, JFR is is writing on the the, the TMP file uh, system, the, the 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 buffers also. Uh, before snapshotting it and uploading to, to data log. And um, in some containers, in some customers, they are limiting this, this, this disk space. And we, we end up with no disk for those temporary files. And we're reaching like uh, no snapshots uh, with an empty snapshot of it. <laughs> and, uh, but it was not very easy to, <laughs> to troubleshoot. Um, but uh, it's not easy also to fix uh, because uh, the async not nature of Jeff uh, writing and everything, it, it's not easy to to, um, uh, to detect that. So, so we have some work around for that and to, to see that. Uh, but it's just that the result is no data for that. But um, yeah, the, the customer was not aware. It, it was uh, proactive uh, for us because we have uh, our alert, alert, alerting system also, and, and we had some bizarre uh, uh, profiles uh, with some exception in parsing and say, oh, what, there is a corrupted uh, profile? But in fact, it, no, it, it was a full disk and with empty profiles. Um, yeah. Yeah, master, Interesting. Uh, go ahead, Van. Oh, I was gonna, uh, uh, yes, I, I was going to ask about the kind of resilience. Uh, so in your, in the, in the chart somewhere in the beginning of the presentation, you showed that uh, here you have a JFR agent that basically captures recording, and also the same agent sends it over the network to uh, to Datadog servers. Uh, and is that a simplified picture, or is that actually how it is? And uh, maybe the could the network issues of sending data to Datadog impact ability to impact the, the agent itself. I, I thought that it would be more resilient to kind of decouple these two and maybe uh, do sending in a separate process. Uh, but it's just what I want to know if that's a simplified version that you showed or you saw no problem, so do, do everything in a single agent. No, it's... Uh, so, in fact, this, uh, this agent is... Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. You're um, so the, the, off a bit. The, it's okay. Yeah. Okay. And so, so the agent is in fact um, uh, the tracer um, 
um, the distributed tracer that uh, we are also providing at Datadog. So it handles the, the instrumentation of, of the most of the frameworks and the, to provide the, the distributed tracing. And we have um, embedded the, the the profiler, but the profiler part is, is very small. It's just enabling the JFR recording and then let JFR do uh, do the, the rest. And sometimes every minute we, we just take the snapshot from JFR, compress it and upload. Um, so yes, the, the, the upload part could be very uh, risky to to, uh, to to that, but the, this is very small part every minute. And if we don't reach the the back end, we just drop the snapshot and and, and move on. So it's not disturbing the, the application uh, in, in that. Sense. We've got mm -hmm. another question from okay. Andre Pangin. Now, uh, so he's asking, uh, don't you think that the default JFR stack size, stack depth, is way too low for profiling a typical application? And what do you normally set uh, the stack depth to? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. <laughs> that, that's that's for, for for my demo. I've uh, increased the the, the the default stack uh, stack traces to have something that is useful for me. Um, so yes, the default one is sixty four. Um, it's uh, for for the for the modern and current application. Uh, it's maybe too late, too too <laughs> too, um, too short. I, I agree, uh, especially for for Sky application, for example. Um, but um, uh, the thing is, is you, you need to 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 keep in mind that um, the the goal of JFR is also to to cap the overhead that you in, impose to the to the application. So JFR was was designed uh, from the from the beginning to be production ready, and to 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 gather those information at production uh, time. So we we need to to be careful about the the amount of uh, data that we generate and and we store. Uh, so that's that's a way also to limit that. Um, but I agree that if you want the full picture, you, you need to increase. And and a large part of our customer are increasing the the, the stack depth uh, for JFR. But you you need to be careful and you need to measure your workload uh, on your application um, and to see if there is a, a measurable impact uh, of using that. Because it's not just beta profiling; it's all events that gather stack traces like the, the, the monitors, um, the allocation, everything uh, can be impacted by uh, a large number of uh, stack traces or deep stack traces. So, so you need to be careful uh, about that. Um, so you need to balance it. It's always a, a trade-off about um, not impacting your application and having a good vision of what's inside uh, your application. Yeah, makes perfect sense. I guess that uh, kind of draws the time that we had to the end. It's been a great talk. Thank you so much. I'm pretty sure there will be a great discussion Thanks. zone as well. You can find uh, the the audience can find the button somewhere in here. I strongly encourage you to click it and join the discussion because we would be very happy to see you and uh, see you soon. I guess everyone.